Massive thank you as always to patrons Sarah Turner, Rebecca Johns and Justin Harper. And this week's random call out goes to patron Jeannie Hunter. You can support us too at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head or follow us on social media and help spread the word. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. Like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Uh, Tracy, thanks very much for Thank you. Um, for joining us. And uh, I don't know what the reaction has been to your book, um, sort of on, a, on a, the, the wider scale, but certainly... I can't even find the words to describe it. It's just like a real. It's um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's real. really stunning what what you accomplished and what it opens for questions about the medicalization of schizophrenia is enormous. Just, just so I guess introductions are done. So Harriet Fraud is a psychotherapist in New York, fraud. and not fraud, 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 <laughs> F R A A D. Luckily, so yes. that means I must have been sort of subtly mispronouncing it this whole time and that made, I'm a terrible terrible human being so i apologize oh, wow. and then uh Ikoi is in san diego and she is a substance abuse counselor i've got that right is that the yes. official title yeah and i have no uh qualifications in the mental health field whatsoever i'm just a human being but i help edit and produce the podcast and you also have great wisdom of for finding people to talk to us and asking great questions. So we're very lucky that you are both a techie and also so tuned in. Well, yes. I'll take that compliment. And uh, But I also have to go away and do my homework and learn how to pronounce names better, lol. <laughs> um, but just, I guess, sort of an opening question then. The, the sort of headline at all of this is essentially that in your book you sort of chronicle various moments in your life, but that essentially you were diagnosed with schizophrenia quite early on. And yes, paranoid schizophrenia. Right. And that ultimately you managed to, uh, I don't know what the right word is, is it overcome schizophrenia? Um, maybe that's wrong. Heal yourself. Yeah, that yeah. You got through it and you did it without um, medication really. And so I guess the sort of starting question is, sort of what are the popular misconceptions um, about uh, paranoid schizophrenia or schizophrenia in general? And sort of what are the myths that still persist even in the mental health professions? I, I think it's the brain disease theory. Mm. And could you describe that a little bit and why it's wrong? Well, there is no brain disease, number one. And it's allowed uh, the first line of treatment to be medication. And uh, like I never use medication. And I think with the first episode, uh, psychosis, uh, they could be working through it than just medicating it right away. I think uh, that's my biggest beef with the whole thing is the brain disease. It's uh, There's no genetic. Nothing's genetic about it. Uh, and uh, the line of treatment is wrong, and it's not a lifelong illness that needs to be managed. Wow, so everything is wrong. Where does it come from, that idea that there's a genetic proclivity towards schizophrenia, so schizophrenics should never have kids and stuff? Where does that come from? What is that? Because that is widely accepted as well as wrong. I think the reason that they assume that there might be a genetic link is because, um, like in my case, my mother had psychosis. Mm -hmm. And that's just because she didn't deal with her trauma. And then right. her behaviors were passed on to me, where she severely abused me. Mm -hmm. And that is not a genetic link. That's like generational abuse. Yes. So I think that's where that. Uh, genetic factor comes in, which I, is wrong too. Sorry. <laughs> One of the things that's remarkable is that in exaggerated fashion, that's done throughout the psychological community where they don't want to look at the social impacts. And particularly in your case, it struck me, they don't want to see the horror of abandoning children to whoever gave birth to them, regardless of their mental health. 
it's bizarre. And, and a lot of them are in foster care and drugged. Mm. Uh, I'm totally against that. And I was in foster care and group homes and various places. But back then, it wasn't the big hype about get them on drugs uh, as it is today. I mean, you know, the, the mention of the brain disease model is is basically the trend with psychiatry and psychology and, and mental health in general. And I, and I also think it's like how the pharmaceutical are uh, uh, selling these drugs on the premise that, you know, you have a chemical imbalance or uh, brain disease. And I just think it gets so ingrained in society that they believe it, too. Joel Covell wrote an article about this a long time ago about how the the whole diagnostic statistical manual with which they assigned diagnoses was funded by the pharmaceuticals industry and continues to be. Yes. And as a way of profiteering off people's pain. And it's a capitalist atrocity. But still, I wonder, after all the suffering that you went through, which frankly kept me up at night, even though I've been a therapist for, you know, a thousand oh, you've years. Oh, you've read the book. Oh, yeah, totally. I want it to be completely honest and uh, just take them into the world of schizophrenia. So, you know, it can, there's more understanding of it. Well, you certainly gave me that, but it made me wonder, after all of that trauma, how did you have the strength to go through the suffering and the memory even though you had you had your kids cared for, I mean, and you did in the book, you reached out to your sister, Sarah. How did you manage with those few supports to get through such horrendous trauma? Well, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. And because of my experience when I was in the psychiatric hospital and I seen what was going on there, I knew not to go to mental health. Mm. And um, I was ready to do it. And once the process started, I couldn't shut it down. And basically, it was just, you know, releasing all those that I had for all those years. And that eliminated all the symptoms, which I call reactions to trauma. And yet, even before that, I was amazed that you hadn't passed it on to your children as your mother's psychosis was passed on to you. Well, I kind of made that decision when I was a kid uh, that when I grew up uh, that I would not harm anybody the way I was harmed. And, you know, my children were so beautiful. Like I talk about that when they were born. It was love at first sight. Yes. And I, put, I couldn't imagine myself uh, ever doing that to a child. Yeah. And that's definitely the bit that struck me because I, I don't understand what that is in people where obviously they you know some people just hurt children and why is it that some people repeat the sort of cycle of abuse and why is it some people don't because like you said just then as a child you made that sort of decision just to i don't want to hurt other people but how does uh, yeah then i I mean like like I'll talk about my mother, like with her and her trauma, it became her identity. Mm -hmm. Uh, She never got help or anything. So uh, it was her choice what she did to me. I I don't know. I honestly just think that you make that choice as a child. Who are you going to be? What are you going to do? You know, I had a lot of obstacles though. (laughs) Yeah, there certainly are because people abuse their children all the time. Yeah. In the United States, they did a study. One in 10 mothers admits hitting their children with objects, not even just their hand. So, and that's what they admit. And so it, I, I think that when people are children, they often identify with the abuser. So they get a sense that this abuser who is in charge of my whole life actually wants what's best for me. And they hate the child in themselves and they pass it on to their children. I think there's a lot of uh, self-hatred, a lot of uh, trauma bonding going on. What does that mean here? Uh, Like you bond to the abuser because you're actually, uh, they're responsible for your survival. 
That's right. So you have to pretend they like you. Well, I mean, it's just a trauma bond. It's you're just stuck in it. But I mean, like the way approach I took as a kid was get the hell away from mother. I don't want anything Mm -hmm. to do with that. Like I literally came to hate her. And that was where I was uh, not connected. Like I disconnected that way. Mm -hmm. My hate for her. I think that is a really important distinction to make, you know, because I I deal with um, people, I guess, a lot of them fall on both sides of having been abused and, you know, been, you know, yeah, abusive to partners, you know, especially within the context of, of, um, you know, chaotic and compulsive drug use when that's involved. Um, but you know, one of the, one of the key things that I have noticed as a pattern in working with a lot of different people is that you, there tends to be less of a a tendency to repeat like parental behavior when they don't associate closely emotionally with the parent. Yes, that makes sense. And the hatred is a sort of lifesaver here. Well, the thing that helped me the most is I read a lot of uh, parenting books because I didn't have anything to like. I knew what happened to me was so wrong that, you know, there is the urge to act out because it's a part of you. But I find that when I read parenting books or I watched like a family show, um, I use that as my guide. And I also uh, use my intuition a lot. What mm-hmm. what would I not want to happen to me? Mm-hmm. So I just based it on that and off I went. Well, I think you're not identifying with your mother. No. Meant that you kept yourself safe, although tormented, because since parents are our only protectors in the world, for a lot of children have to pretend that there's some reasonableness to the unreasonable abuse that they receive and that it's for their own good and that they're the bad one. And it's miraculous that you preserved your sense of decency through this. Um, but I did hate myself. Yeah. Yeah. It did sound like that. I just hated myself. I couldn't, I couldn't even look in the mirror. Like I just, I was, you know, I, so that transferred on to me, you know, because you're thinking mm-hmm. like, why does my mother hate me so much? Right. Like my other sibling, there's four of us. Uh, uh, my younger sister, she was abused too. That's all I want to say about that. I don't want to talk about my sister too much, but I mean, like, I guess different people oh. cope in different ways. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And my sister did hate herself too. So you know, I guess there's all kinds of ways that we learn to cope, right? I just felt like I was in a battle and I had to preserve myself and find whatever way possible I could do that. Oh, you won. Yes, I did. In that you there and conscious. That's quite an achievement. Yeah, it was hard work. And then even when I did come out of the psychosis, I had to do like I did a lot of crying and feeling work and a lot of writing, but I also had a lot of behaviors to correct and just yes. change my thoughts. Like, you're not bad, you're good. So it's a lot mm-hmm. of work. Yes, it's a lot of work that you believed in enough to do. It. Yeah, I wanted a good life and I got my good life. Mm. This is why it feels so unfair to label this stuff or, or call it a disorder, the schizophrenia stuff, because you know, the aim of your book is to, as you said, to sort of reveal how something like this might come about. And, you know, you very much go into details about um, your experiences uh, with abuse and with your family and et cetera. And it's pretty clear from reading it that it's the idea that schizophrenia is just some freak genetic disorder, some brain thing, is like a Mm -hmm. really... Uh, it just doesn't make any sense Um, because it doesn't take into sort of the context the person's particular experiences, their life. Right. Um, But none of the 
doses take into consideration. Right. That was what I was about to say is, you know, I mean, especially with the the much stronger trend now of the biochemical angle of mental health, mm-hmm. you know, that a lot of, you know, because I, I, you know, one of the things that I often used to tell, you know, clients, especially like, you know, if they got diagnosed in like a really, really bad time in their life, you know, especially if they mm-hmm. were still actively, you know, using in in fairly like effective, strong amounts, is is that those diagnoses, one diagnosis is not, you know, I've known people to go to several different people and get like, you know, usually related, but different diagnosis, you mm-hmm. know, different treatment. Um, and I always tell my clients, especially, especially if they've gotten diagnosed in like a really bad time in their life that, you know, diagnoses are not necessarily, it, it's not like, you know, you can run a blood test and say you have high cholesterol, you know, like that that's a pretty solid thing that you can like, you know, test for, right? You know, mental health doesn't quite work in that kind of way where like, you know, you have this diagnosis and this is what you have permanently, right? right? You know, but it's kind of, it, it is one of those things that oftentimes, you know, people get a lot of relief from having a diagnosis, but I also feel like it can really trap people. Yes. In many yes, ways. Yes, it pigeonholes well. people. Yeah. I also really think that people have already exposed the fact that everything you do in life and every state you're in emotionally has a biochemical component. Oh, absolutely. And the National Institutes of Mental Health even say that the Diagnostic Statistical Manual is faulty because it doesn't reveal the etiology of your behavior, how you got there. However, they don't have the budget to advertise that the pharmaceutical industry does. And so it's a capitalist profit at the expense of a mass of people's self-worth and self and treatment. It's it's really a colossal crime. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's about expedience too. You know, like profit and experience. Yeah, because giving somebody a, a, you know, say, hey, here's a pill, take it so many times a day is a lot less intensive in terms of like care and service and need than trying to do like real wraparound service. Because that's one of the major issues with, you know, homelessness, for example, and mental health, where you know, giving some a homeless person just like medication is not going to necessarily, you know, make them happy, right? or, 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 or the even better, right? Um, I don't think the medications actually work for trauma. Because no. I've like spoken to a lot of people that are diagnosed with schizophrenia. And the number one complaint, they say, oh, my God, I don't feel like myself. I can't cope. I'm no, still right. having hallucinations. And I think these the the biochemical route is actually pushed for funding. You know that's how psychiatrists get paid. They, they for insurance claims they have to write down a medical reason. So you know that's why they have so many disorders in their little bible, the the manual, mm-hmm. the DSM. Because I've spoken to psychiatrists, psychologists, and they all tell me the same. They know it's not a brain disease. However, you know, if you look at the four interlocking profiteers here, the drug companies, the doctors, the insurance companies, and the hospitals, they're all making money here. And at least in America, making money is the holy grail. And so I think that's why we are so backward in this area. It's a tragedy. And I don't know how psychiatry is going to come back from this because um, I would think that like once it comes out like in the public or whatever that, you know, they're not brain diseases. I would think that there would be mass lawsuits. You would hope, but they are psychopharmacologists, psychiatrists, and that is what they are tied in with the psychopharma industry. Yes. and. fighting very hard through their huge advertising budgets 
And America is the only country where they allow direct to consumer advertising, but through their huge advertising budgets, concealing the truth that you reveal, Tracy, that's our enemy here. Yes, and that's why I'm here. Did you set up a website? Is that correct? Sort of outlining um, resources for people? Uh, yeah, I do have a website. I, I put it up there two years ago. It's uh, www.fullrecoveryfromschizophrenia.ca. And I list a lot of resources there. And actually, I just put up pictures that were sent to me of when I was uh, full-blown psychosis, when I had been abandoned by the foster care system and I ended up being homeless and uh, I, sh- I show pictures of how sick I was. So, I mean, it's interesting now, obviously, there's a sort of uh, perspective or, or wisdom that's come from all of this. But early on, there was times where you were put in mental health institutions. And, yes. you know, again, you were talking about your intuition like, what was that experience? Because you're seeing people take drugs mm. and you're seeing yeah. what happens to them. Like, you know, what is going through your mind at that point? Like, how does this all s- start to form, the, you know, this sort of I don't want to do drugs thing? Well, the thing that disturbed me the most was when there was a man, he was yelling that he didn't want to take the drugs. And then out of nowhere, like orderlies just came, held him down. And the nurse injected him with, uh, I suspect, probably an antipsychotic. And then they just dragged him away. And I was just shocked that it was all out in the open. And then another thing that was quite shocking to me that it was almost like the, well, it was, the staff were on one side and then the patients were just alone sitting there, drugged Mm -hmm. up. Some of them could hardly speak. And, And that was normal care. I mean, there is a reason why people call, you know, a lot of the care in in psychiatric hospitals chemical straitjacketing. I call it that mm. too. Yeah. And then, and then after I seen and witnessed all that, that was me like pony up, like let's act like the the nurses and not like the patients. And uh, you basically have to like h- hide your condition and try to act normal. But I mean, like that yes. that image of that man sits with me to the, to this day i couldn't believe it yeah there's a quote in your in your book and i think it was around that bit that everyone had had a story to tell but nobody wanted to listen no right. there was that no was no communication i thought that was kind of weird because they were coming to the hospital cuz they were like in distress and you know the first thing you want to do is talk but there was no talk mm. it was just you know the nurses coming out and handing out medication i i was really turned off by that too so as a result i never went back and i actually was living on the streets and i chose the streets rather than go to mental health that's a, that's because I didn't want to be drugged. Yeah, that's a very common thing that I I hear from you know quite a lot of people. Yeah, and then society thinks that the, these people are just living on the streets because they want to be there. You know, it it still like blows my mind to this day. Like if I'm downtown and the homeless are out, people just walking by. Like I mean, it's a society uh, issue too. Yeah. It is, and yet individual people walk by because they feel powerless to change. It's a systemic issue. And if in New York City, where I live, if I stop to help the homeless on each block, I would never get where I'm going, no less be able to help everybody. No, I mean, like, the our governments, our mental health or whatever should not be leaving. Right. right. People on the streets, they should have somebody come around, pick them up, you know, try to get them off the street. We have a lot of resources here. Like there's a lot of uh, like shelters and uh, a lot of subsidized housing for them. But as because the weather's so warm here, as soon as we get them built, you know, we have another slew of people coming in from another province. But we So we can't fix the problem. Well, where exactly are you that you have these services? I'm on, Doesn't sound like the U.S. I'm in Canada. 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 Yeah. Right. Canada. Oh, no wonder. 
Mm -hmm. so, our, okay. so where I live is more sense. community driven. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that was one of the things that sort of struck me about um, your recovery. Obviously, I'm sort of skipping ahead more towards sort of the end of the story or the end of the book, but it was just this, the bit where you are able to call social services and just say, look, can you come take my kids mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks because I've got a yeah. lot of stuff I need to deal with. Like, that, that, that you were able to sort of write your way to the first yeah. stage of of like feeling normal or feeling healthy like it just all blows my mind because it's it's sort of beautiful but it's also one of those things like in the background to all of this and maybe there's further details i don't fully appreciate that there is some sort of thing working in the background like the state you know there is social services they will come that you know they're not going to sort of judge you there is uh housing that you can get there is sort of some sort of welfare and that seems to mm. me like a key part of the background to, you know, beyond just your absolute self determination to to be better, get better. Well, I didn't, I didn't want my kids to see me in that mental state. Like my kids were young mm. then, and then my son. There's there's a four year difference, so he did get to see some some of my madness. Um, but we talk about it and he knows where I've been and, you know, they've got the book and stuff. But I mean, like at that time, it was like, I've got to get these kids out of the house. I'm about to crash. I don't want them to see it. It was so responsible and loving to understand that and to protect them. Did you worry you were sending them into an unprotected system? That's Not at I all. Good. Not at all. I've been in like four or five group homes and, you know, I didn't receive any uh, help or anything, but um, it was always a safe place for me. Oh, that's good. Oh, in the that's, United States, it wouldn't be. Yeah, I was I was just about to say, you know, that um, I, I was going to comment that living, I guess, in Canada, there must be some differences in some ways because one of the biggest fears that you know a lot of people have around especially parents around you know mental health and drug use in the United States especially is that they'll never see you know they'll never get their kids back again mm. but that's also, a very also, I'm afraid of that yeah well, you can tell also um parents should be afraid that if their kids go into foster care, they may be going into abusive foster care. Well, yeah. I think also that another thing is that, um, like in foster care, it wasn't like, you know, just a bunch of strangers or whatever. Like in the last group I was in, these were trained professionals. Oh. You know, but I didn't receive any therapy or anything. It would, the more focus was like, trying to get me to do schoolwork and, you know, teach me words and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, and then back then they weren't drugging everybody. That's good. Um, they weren't drugging the kids. Like there was a couple of kids on drugs, but I mean, uh, it was a choice for me when I was in like the group home and foster care, it wasn't pushed on me like it is today. Yeah. I, I know that, you know, several of my, um, people that I've known that have gone through group homes have talked. And I think the drive started really in the 90s with with medicating kids. Oh, yeah. That's what it feels, you know, it seems like there's a big shift between the 80s and 90s in terms of experience of people in the foster care system. But I think 90s is when it really ramped up started to ramp up because that's kind of the um the delineation of when I start to see you know looking back at people's medical history because doing intake you often you know do a pretty extensive interview okay, process I've got lots of files <laughs> yeah you know and there's a case. yeah there's a big jump between the 80s and 90s of you know my people that I've known that have gone into the foster care system, oftentimes that was their entry into getting medicated as kids. Yeah. yeah, it's wild because the makers of the drug Ritalin, which is 
overwhelmingly used and recommended in schools and all around the United States for intention deficit disorder, was proven and published an article about there was a conspiracy between the drug maker and a psychiatrist, and that it's not necessary, but it's still routinely used because whatever science comes up with doesn't have the advertising budget. Well, I think that the, right now, psychiatry, they're trying to push the responsibility over to family physicians now. Like just that thing, you know, how the chemical imbalance theory was disproven. Yeah. So they're trying to push it on to, well, we don't give antidepressants like that. That's the family physician. So they're mm. always passing the responsibility off. No, they pass it off, but also exemplify it. Exactly. I don't think these labels are going to go away any anytime soon because yeah. they need them to get paid. Yeah, I think you'd have to do away with the profit system in of doctors, hospitals, insurance companies and pharmaceutical manufacturers, which sustain this. Yeah, you would have to have an anti-capitalist initiative that changes public health in order to change this. Well, the doctors aren't, the psychiatrists aren't going to let that happen because they're making huge profits off these lectures and all the funding that's going into the, like the brain model. Absolutely. And then, yeah, like, and then the newest thing that we're going to come into is like online services through Zoom. And now they have implants. They're about the, they've done the first case on a, on a woman that, uh, had uh, chronic uh, depression and she's she got the implant they're working on oh right right those those kinds of implants not the yes. elon Musk neural link implant no 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 not that that's yeah. happening in sweden it's electro it's 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 electrical it's sending electrical impulses if if yes. i mean, yeah what yeah. does it do what uh, is what, accomplished by that so the main accomplishment of that is i you the certain mental conditions, you know, if you look at brain imaging scans, have act active, overactive, underactive areas. So what these implants do is balance things out by activating the um, underactive areas. Usually. Yeah, it stimulates the brain. Yes. So what happens to people when they have these things? Well, I mean, there are like non-implant ways to do this as well. Like there's a um, electro, you know, magnetic therapy for depression where like, you know, you sit under a machine and and so you don't necessarily need implants to do a similar mm -hmm. thing. Implants is just one way of do, accomplishing the same thing that you can do without an implant. But, you know, generally speaking, it relieves symptoms. Yeah. So yeah. It, it is one way of you know, a drug-free way of relieving symptoms. But this is one of the key insights, at least for me when reading your book, was this idea that, um, and I think you stated at the beginning, that drugs can be useful in that sort of short-term moment where you just need to stabilise yeah. your head, right. that that's where they're really good. But long-term, yeah. it's not going to do you any favours because they block the very thing that you need to deal with, right? And so... Right. Whether it's whether it's drugs or whether it's going to be like electric shocks to your brain or whatever whatever it is, it's like the the key part of of your story really is you know very early on you recognise you don't really want to touch the drugs. You have various sort of psychological tools that you've improvised to sort of manage what's going on in your head, but at a certain point that just is like I can't you know I have to deal with this now, and then it was about sort of creating the space and the time for you to do that. And, and I think that's the key friction here, as is often the case in, in uh, recording episodes of these podcasts, you come up against that um, what actually works takes a long time and, mm. you know, potentially takes a lot of money, <clears throat> whether support. it's the individual, the state, you know, and support, and then what's cheap and makes loads of money and it's like, and fast yes. and it's, and it's drugs. And I, I just feel like you're, story is as well as being this sort of you know kind of uh and it's like this psychological epic in a way you just you managed to sort of not do the impossible but you just did it you got 
you got healthier and it's so, through so much adversity and I think it's like the blueprint of like this is how people get better mm -hmm. um they you know it has all those components that help someone show how someone can get better and and the drug thing just isn't that not in the long term no well, the, drugs, means, the drugs weren't uh, meant for long term they were only designed for short term mm -hmm. and that's why you see all these people complaining now that like look what the drugs did to me right I'm permanently disabled so and also they block the brain's own self-soothing mechanisms with these other drugs. But I don't see that changing unless you could, at least in the United States, unless you could dismantle the insurance companies by having public health that's, re, that's available to everyone and the pharmaceuticals industry by taking the profit out of that. And the doctors paying them reasonably but the way every public health system would but not excessively so that they could a psychiatrist can see someone for 15 minutes and charge 150 to 300 dollars and just that 15 minutes he's asking a few questions or she is and writing out prescriptions that it's sad uh, it's so sad it's an interlocking corporate structure that would have to be changed through social change and I think Canada is better because they have less of an almighty profit system, even though they have serious problems. Well, I mean, like our current treatment plan right here on the island is we have a unique situation. Our province is the only one uh, where if you if the doctor says you're going in the hospital, you've agreed to all treatment, including ECT. A lot of people Whoa. leave the province. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the big fears. It's a little bit off topic, but one of the big fears around, you know, debates about public health and universal care is, you know, the question of like consent to treatment yes. and do patients, because one of the major issues of the trends in medication right now, whether that's mental health or physical, is it's kind of a very broad, like if you have this condition, you yeah. know, it's here, here's, it's it's basically a flow chart of, you know, these, this diagnosis, this symptom, this is a treatment that you get instead of a very, you know, individualized treatment between a doctor and a patient right which is more time and money which is more time and money and uh, yeah absolutely so you know one one aspect of the the debate around public health and you know especially mental health um is about consent and is about patient having control over their treatment because that's one area that, you know, people really often don't. You that's can go right. into a hospital, you can go into a hospital, for example, you know, when I was at the hospital, if you are capable physically of advocating for yourself, you know, you can't look over your chart and say, no, I'm not taking this medication. No, I do not want that procedure. Right. And that will be respected in a regular hospital in a mental hospitals you know Mom. that's a very different story you can't be like oh no i'm not taking this medication no because like, you, your judgment is not considered sound right you know so yeah that's that's a that's another terrifying aspect that because i think what a lot of people don't understand about the mental health industry and and the mental health as a from a patient end of you know things is there's nothing more terrifying than the help being so terrifying yes right. it, it's a complete sense of abandonment and isolation when everyone around you is like go get help and as a patient you're like you don't understand what this help is because it's it makes you helpless that treatment it, it renders it, your agency right Ill. Yeah, that's, you know, that's one of the very difficult aspect of 
you know, working as somebody that works mm-hmm. kind of on the treatment side of the industry and hearing mm-hmm. so much and, you know, and I mean, the, Tracy's accounting is, you know, something that's very familiar to me just from listening to, you know, a lot of people over time and their experience with the mental health industry. So, you know what I think the solution is? What? If we could just get insurance companies to pay therapists, psychologists, uh, just whatever, so they can go see those people instead of like just going to the psychiatrist that is just focused on the brain. But they're not Uh, interested in helping you. They're not interested in helping you. They're interested in, in making money. And it costs much less to medicate people than to listen to them. And so that's but in what the long do. run, in the long run, like the big picture, it's more beneficial to help them instead of having people coming like 10, 20 years in and through the house, the hospital all the time. Why yeah. don't you just like I always think that like, you know, train the staff, right? Start Mm -hmm. opening like healing centers or, you know, uh, and then just help them recover and then retrain them like lived experience and then let them work with them. But their philosophy is sell the quick fix. Yeah, I know. It's not long term mental health. It's sell the quick fix. Take the money and run. Tracy's point really is that on a long enough timeline, that all just falls apart, right? Like there's no, there's potentially no more functioning members of society left, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I mean, look at through, look at through COVID. They've got the the COVID uh, trauma now, yeah. so they're handing out pills for that, right? I think I think also I, one thing I just wanted to mention was I thought the uh, the your relationship with nature sort of very early on. Uh, yes in the book and and your life i thought was just sort of brilliant um and and like a um i don't know if you wanted to talk about like the the story that really sort of um moved me a lot was your experience with uh, lying on the grass mm. oh my god that's my favorite part too yeah. that was my go to I could lay in the long grass and my mind would just empty and it was so peaceful. And that was one of my, one of my main tools. And then I played a lot of sports. And the funny thing is I was talking to my uh, baby sister uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, she's, uh, you know, in therapy now and writing things down. And I said, Oh, read me something. It was the exact same thing. She was going to the grass too. Yeah. I mean, it was total freedom there. Like I I was so, oh, I was so happy. I could have just lived out in a forest or something. And I think that's why it's important when people have schizophrenia or, you know, psychosis, whatever you want to call it, that they're in nature. I I read a study on that once. Oh, yeah. What did it say? I read it 15 or 16 years ago, but um, it, it it came out of Japan and it wasn't necessarily specific to schizophrenia, but talking about like various mental health conditions being benefited by, you know, proximity to nature, whether whether it was residential settings, meaning like not necessarily hospital, but, you know, where the patient lived. You know, and mm-hmm. how much access they had to and to nature and encouraging that um, improving outcomes. There's a thing that I read I, I read just this morning, which is about um, Parks Canada said it was joining the National Nature Prescription Program, known as mm-hmm. Parks, uh, which mm-hmm. aims to get patients into nature for a minimum of two hours per week, because ultimately it helps, you know, it works. Well, it does. It does work. But, but the, 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 there was this bit specifically where I think it's sort of early on in, in your description of, of nature where you've internalized all this, as you said, sort of self-hatred. Mm. And you use the grass as like almost like an early science experiment, right? You were scared that, you know, you touch the grass and that yes. overnight. I mean, I, I don't want to tell you a story if, if, if you'd like to 
t- tell it? I was living at my aunt's house with my family and her big family. And when I first got there, um, like on the lawn or whatever, I it was so beautiful and everything. And I wanted to go sit out there. So I did. So then the I went to bed at night and then I walked down, walked out of the room in the morning. And the first thing I did was go on to the, the ledge of the, the front bay window and look out to see if the grass was alive. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like a moment in time where I thought maybe there was something good about me because I had not killed the grass by sitting on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's self-hate. Yeah. It sure is. But but it was beautiful because it was this link with like the natural world and like your sort of lived yes. environment was so threatening and there was so much abuse of power in, you know, whether it was home or various institutions, sort of, uh, or, you know, homelessness more than the institutions maybe, but the... Well, the, I was, I've always been in uh, sync with nature. Yeah. Like, I mean, I live on an island, mm. so I'm surrounded by trees all the time, but my two children or whatever, they're like in their early 30s and they're like still camping and fishing and doing and all that. It's a, just a beautiful place to raise children. So, I mean, that that was my uh, coping mechanism. But I mean, I actually, when I was in that place in nature, I was so connected, like, I could almost say that it's a God connection. Mm. Like I was just in sync with it. Yeah. And the, the way you describe your desire not to kill the grass. Yeah. Does point to, you know, a, a really, the reason you feel that way is because you feel such a connection too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like as a kid, as you read in the book, I'm in the ravine a lot and I'm like, you know, really little and I'm on my own and I'm building a tree fort and I'm in the river and I have absolutely no supervision. Mm. You know, I mean, like I could have drowned in the river and in the lake, but I mean, I just loved it there. I was down there all the time and that was my peace of mind, that and sports. Yeah. There's such a protection in nature. I mean, I didn't have a level of acute trauma that you did, but as a little toddler, I moved around a lot. My parents uh, weren't around sometimes, but being in the tall grass when no one could find me, yeah, I finally had an island of safety from other people's needs calls my mother tied a bell around my neck so she'd know where I was and not have to look and so I just I was only two but I held the clapper on the bell and so I could go in the tall grass and just sit there and feel so safe it's a sense that mother nature loves you yeah it's just a place of like pure love you know and you get the energy from it and it just makes you feel so good yeah Oh, that's awful. A cowbell. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it had a big clapper I could hold on to. Wow. And so it was quiet. It's funny how like our parents or whatever, they do things without any knowledge or understanding how it could affect us. Or any wish to find it. They can't yeah. imagine that we are people. They're these beings they have to manage who they have as part of a right of being an adult, having children, with no thought to the humanity of the child and probably no realization of their own childhood or they couldn't pass that on. Yeah, I kind of raised my kids to like um, just say how they feel and if they had to confront me about something that maybe I said or did or whatever, they're still doing it now. Um, And just be open and just be who you are. Like I, I learned a lot from my experience mm. and how I want to treat people. Yeah, that's very, you know, I had a friend whose father was terribly violent, ended up killing his girlfriend and another woman and then himself. But he used to talk about his father and he said he was a dark lighthouse shining a beam of where I couldn't go. That's a, yeah. that's a very... I think we I think we all suffer. People suffer. Life life has a lot of suffering. It does, and it also has te- 
terribly inflicted suffering on children, there isn't even because the history of the family is that children were chattel and you could rent them out or do whatever you wanted with them if you look at the history of the family. But that really the idea of children as humans is relatively recent. The ASPCA and the the prevention of cruelty to animals laws came way before the child abuse laws, which didn't even start in the U.S. till 1967. Mm -hmm. And the 1962 expose of the battered child syndrome. That was... Um, that reminded me of something when I was a kid, I had a dog and my mother horribly abused the dog. Like she would just walk by the dog and the dog would just piss all over the carpet. And that was like a trained police dog. And for the longest time, I couldn't have animals. But trust me, I've got animals now. Mm. (laughs) But I mean, like, I understand what you're saying that animals can be treated better than humans. But that yes. was that was certainly one of those moments again, which is like anyone who, it, you know, if you, if you treat an animal like that, and then you see how it it reacts, like in your description of you, you talk early on about being a child and sort of um, hiding under the table as well, or yes. I, maybe I've misremembered yeah. that. But the dog does exactly the same thing, right? Yeah, and yes. and that was a key thing. It's like you know, it's boggles my mind that anyone can <clears throat> say, you know, oh, this person has this disorder of paranoid schizophrenia, when it's, uh, again, the context of the person's life, it's like, you know, the dog is also terrified of this woman. Does the dog have paranoid schizophrenia as well? And I know that there actually is a guy yeah. who goes around diagnosing animals. I can't remember where the article was, but his his thing was the same conclusion. It's like, uh, there are lots of animals in zoos, for example, that have all these mental health conditions that belong in the DSM. But the reason <laughs> that they they have all these in things the is because they've been taken out of their natural habitat, right? They're sort of... Confined. Uh, confined. And so it's no surprise that they have these... Uh, they're not having a great time. And it's just the bit... Yeah, that parallel between how your mother treated the dog and the, how the dog reacted, how you reacted, it was all just... I, I mean... For me, it was all just sort of, you know, uh, very emotionally overwhelming because it was all just about, you know, severe abuses of power and Mm. powerlessness and how you get through that. And I thought that your psychological tools you had as a as a kid, like you had the boxing sort of thing. You talked a lot about having oh yeah, yeah, putting stuff on the shelf. Um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about the sort of the box thing for the for the listeners. Oh, I just had a, as a child, I had a vivid imagination. So, I mean, like, I would just have it how I box things. Like, if something happened, I'd put it in an imaginary box. And then I pretended that I was putting it at the back of my mind that I couldn't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's how I describe it. And then, you know, as more abuse happened or whatever, the boxes were getting so full And uh, when I was around other people, like other kids or whatever, I was always afraid that the box was going to fall off the shelf and they were going to be able to see what happened to me. So I used uh, that. That was a psychological defense to use use it that way. But I mean, like even when I was a kid, I was always creative. So Mm -hmm. that helped, too. I had lots of tools. Yeah, another tool that I had a client who had 29 alternative personalities. And when things were so horrible, they happened to somebody else. And that was his box to put that child. That child wasn't there anymore. And then he was, it wasn't him. It was this other child, which is another way of coping with extreme trauma. Yeah, I I, I believe I read that book, uh, Sybil. Oh, that's a different book. Yeah. Yeah, that's like multiple personality, right? Yes, multiple personality. They call yeah. it dissociative now. Oh, it's dissociative got a different name. Disorder, yeah. right. Yeah. Because you I dissociate can't keep up with all the names. Yeah, well, it's the same phenomenon. Right. The person you were had more pain than they could live with. And so they were a different person. Yeah. Yeah, I think, do you guys think that there's still a lot of child abuse going on still? 
Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I don't think that goes away. <laughs> uh, no, and with every society, society. Not at all. Because children are chattel. Most child abuse happens before age six, because at six, you're in school for six hours or more, and you can run. So it, it happens while children are still home. And that's where 85% of the murders of children happen. And so, of course, we know it happens. And whenever there's a recession, there's a spike in child abuse. And they've, mm. yeah. they've mapped it. The shaken baby syndrome appears at the hospital with every recession in far greater number, where people shake their baby until their brain turns to jelly because it's crying disturbs them. Wow. So what is happening now? They're just, I don't read up on it. So like if there's still a lot of child abuse, are they just going into foster care? Or nobody knows. Yes, well, most of it isn't reported. Okay. Yeah, most of it and isn't during, reported. Um, right. Social services in the United States are ex- under extreme yeah. duress um, and overloading. So, uh, LA County actually had a big uh, issue with their social services not being able to follow up in, you know, high. Um, several cases where the children ended up dead. Yeah. 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 And it's, yeah. I mean, you, we've had a constant, you know, slashing of, of social, social services. services. It's the wealthy don't want to pay taxes and the politicians don't want to tax them because that we have a pay to play democracy. And right. so they need well, it's, it's the donations. Just not a, it's just not a political priority. Yeah, right. unfortunately, regardless of how it's funded, you know, it's not a political priority. And one of the major, you know, one of the major aspects between like, you know, earlier, the comment that, you know, animals get treated better than people, mm-hmm. right, is animals are given a presumpt innocence that people aren't. Yeah, you oh. don't project onto your animal. Plus, animals need a whole lot less care. You know, yeah. just because you get knocked up, of course, doesn't mean you could take care of a vulnerable being for 24 hours. That's a bizarre assumption, which is assumed. And that's why there isn't a month that doesn't go by in the United, in New York where there is some expose as if it's so unusual about another kid being killed by their parents. Because mm. the stresses are really severe. And people don't see children as human. And they are a lot of work for which people are unprepared. They often have children because they think, oh, I'll be loved. Well, they might be, but the kid needs a lot of care. We're the most dependent beings of any other animals. And so they have to work. And that is often intolerable. Yeah. Plus, you know, I had a client whose wife made him come in because every time baby would cry he'd say I'll kill it I'll kill it my god and I'm a hypnotherapist and what we as well as a regular therapist but in hypnotherapy what he couldn't stand was the baby crying inside himself that would never stop and so that that voice of his own crying which was never comforted is what he heard in the baby and he was totally threatened. And once he got that out and he cried about it, then he could cradle his baby and feel okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, that story brings us sort of full circle to your sort of ultimate, um, you know, moment of sort of mass progression, I guess, that that you were able to cry You know, you're able to get in contact with your emotions. You're able to sort of, I guess, metaphorically take all these boxes off the shelf one by one and and deal with them. And and just your ability to, uh, you know, I I think maybe a lot of people can relate, but certainly I could just that you turn to writing to help just sort of see this stuff on the page and and, and figure it out. And uh, I thought that was a really powerful and sort of really useful way of, um, yeah, dealing with everything. I imagine that, that, Liam, that if I would have known that mm. 
years ago that I just needed to cry and get this stuff out, I wouldn't have spent the, the 19 years in the in the schizophrenic world. Yeah. yeah. And it really bothers me that they're that the doctors are leaving them in that mental state. It's like horrific. It's torture is what it is. It is, it is torture. Well, there, there's also like another aspect of, and this is pertaining to therapy more than psychiatry because psychiatrists don't, you know, do talk therapy anymore. But one aspect of American therapy that I've always found really disturbing or harmful, I guess, is this excessive focus on positivity to the point where... Yeah. Oftentimes, you know, I have, whether it's friends or clients or anybody else that, you know, tells me of their therapy experience, one of the more common threads and the common experience in like the American therapy environment is people not being able to express negative emotions fully in therapy because the therapist is always trying to reroute to gratitude yeah. and positivity. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, reframing and, and on one hand, you, I understand that, you know, from talking to therapists about this, that it's a it's a time and ex again, it's a time and expedience issue. Right. That a lot of therapists are concerned that, you know, if they let their clients kind of get too much into their feelings and then they're running out of time and they don't have you know, the, the time and the ability to kind of like balance them out before they send them out of the office. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it, and like, you know, they're driving home in traffic, like crying their eyes out and getting into a car accident or whatever. And I understand that those are like actual real constraints, unfortunate to, you know, our current context, <laughs> but it is really vital that people are able to express, you know, negative things as a negative instead of being pressured and forced to in an artificial timeline you know absolutely to a negative to, from a negative to a positive that that's always the pressure is that when something bad like you know not every not every lemon can be turned into a lemonade some lemons just rot exactly <laughs> And, you know, there's Barbara Ehrenreich has a very good book. She had cancer and obviously cancer isn't a, a joyful experience, but she wrote a book called Bright Sided. That the right. worst part of her cancer suffering was that she was supposed to be so cheerful about it. Yeah. By the professionals involved. Well, there's think, there people have and I think one of the major issues with you know, that in society is that we are such a conflict averse society. We don't mm -hmm. know what to do with conflict. At the end of the day, negative feelings are usually the basis of conflict. Like you usually don't get into a fight with people when they're like, I'm feeling great. Hey, how about you? <laughs> I'm feeling great too. Oh yeah, we're going to fight right now, right? Like that usually doesn't happen. It's <laughs> usually because of, you know, somebody having some kind of negative experience, negative feeling, and not having a good way of being able to overcome that together cooperatively. Yeah, it's true. I was telling a client of mine who's very exuberant about getting a divorce that I couldn't find a card for her with a card with little cans, a car with cans attached to it, towards it clattering and making noise with a big sign, just divorced. You know, we don't have that. We Or congratulations, your mother finally died. I mean, there in the, if you go into a card store, you don't find any of the real feelings that people can have about events. I'm old, so I all my friends' parents are died, have died, and those in whose eyes they were precious and loved miss and grieve, and those in whose parents' eyes they were really demeaned are very happy. And why isn't that or ambivalent? Or ambivalent. Or ambivalent, right. Yeah. You know, I had, I did not have a good relationship with my father. And one of the major things about his passing that was that I had very little reference to 
you know, in terms of, yeah. because people expect you to kind of either be happy that they're dead, like, or if, if they were, you know, abusive, they're like, well, why aren't you happy? And it's, it's a very strange Next. place of ambivalence that it, can be very difficult to navigate. That's true. Well. That's true. So it's there, but there is no, like, I'm ambivalent about your death cards. Yes. <laughs> That's right. But it is, it's, a, it's a phenomenal insight, actually. The idea that what isn't in the card shop is what's really going on. Right. That's sort of fascinating. Yes, it is, because it means that these things are literally unspeakable. Ambivalence, mm. negativity is unspeakable, so it cannot be spoken publicly. I still think about those things, like how society is, like, with showing feelings. Like, I mean, like, if I'm upset or whatever, I'm going to deal with it right away. Mm. If I need to cry, I'm going to do this or this. But, I mean, I'm lucky. Like, all my friendships, they're all authentic. Like, they cry in front of me and get mad and everything. But, I mean, like, once we leave our houses or whatever and the people we pass by and, like, it's it's like an emotional unemotional world we live in well you're allowed to have positive emotions but it's a denial of pain because you're allowed to be happy yeah my uh, husband's favorite saying is uh tracy you're the only one that i know that wakes up in the morning too happy <laughs> <laughs> well, i'm happy to be alive <laughs> yeah it's cute Wait. In terms of emotion, it's there. There is a definite power dynamic because those in in power are able to have the full range of emotions, right? Mm -hmm. it, like, for example, in the workplace, bosses, bosses yeah. can be incredibly, you know, dysregulated, yell at right. people, disrespectful, Bullying. right? And that gets a pass in a way that subordinate positions absolutely are not allowed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of these emotions and the ability to express them is very dependent on the power relationship between yes. the two people, right? That's that's why, you know, as as you see in like a lot of American, you know, sometimes... You know, you see these footages of, you know, people being really unreasonable in stores and restaurants. Yes. Right. And, and that's a power money. dynamic. That's the power dynamic. As a customer, you are able to often right. be, you know, extremely unreasonable. But that's there's right. a difference between a genuine emotional expression and what we have a lot in the United it, it worldwide. I'm not going to say it's just the United States, the worldwide phenomena. But a lot of expressions of negativity are often displacement, right? You're yeah. displacing it onto somebody else that has no clue, usually, like the store clerk you know, the person serving your coffee, you're actually unable to express emotions fully to responsible people. And that's a huge part of the issue, again, with like conflict in and how we deal with it in society. Yeah, because those people are not available to us. In New York, Governor Cuomo just had to uh, resign because part of it, the reason is he was a sex abuser and part of it is he was a terrible bully in his offices and felt empowered to do that because he was the governor. Just, just, as, a, uh, just as a side, I guess, um, I remember reading a book uh, a few years ago uh, called The Examined Life, which was from a, a therapist and sort of each chapter was given an example. Yeah, of, that's a great book. Yeah, of various things their clients had gone through. And one of them was this person who had this sort of, I guess, some sort of paranoid fantasy. And it was that they were coming back home and they were going to, about to open their door and they imagined that someone had wired the flat up, uh, sorry, you know, the apartment, the building, with um, mm. bomb. Uh, and that if she turns the key, like either her uh, house is going to explode or her car would. And then sort of what he untangled from that um, or the discussion he had with the client was that it was this thing about 
there was no one at home and it was ultimately about a feeling of being alone. And the fantasy or the paranoid fantasy was a way of having someone there, like that you are important, that someone is paying attention. And I thought, like, going back to this sort of right to the beginning of the podcast, that this idea that schizophrenia comes from terror, in reading some of your descriptions of, you know, what was going through your head and the things you were experiencing, the paranoia, I thought, but does that fit that same thing? You know, like it's a replacement for the sort of loving parent that should be there and should be saying you matter and giving you attention. And so the paranoia becomes that. It's like it's a way of self-monitoring in a way. Like you're here, you are sort of in the world. Important. And you are important, no, but it's like a dark version of it. I just like to comment on the paranoia. Mm. Um, my paranoia wasn't like, to become a fantasy, I think it was because I was so, uh, I was living with a sexual predator. Yeah. Yes. And uh, my behavior, and I was watched all the time, and he was always cornering me and everything. And then I had transferred that to the outside world. Yeah. That, um, like, when I went out of my mind or whatever, I mean, I was in a freeze response there. So I was still living in those moments. And then it was transferred to the outside world. So um, right. the paranoia was basically me reliving, reliving, reliving all the time. And then how that the my perpetrator's uh, intrusive uh, control over me, uh, how I seen the outside world. So that's how that came about. I also think it, it can happen sometimes that the rage that people feel when they're mistreated is then projected onto other people who they see coming at them because they are so angry. Well, I, I didn't really have themselves. any, I didn't really have any rage, but I did have a negative outlet and that was uh, stealing everything that wasn't nailed down. Mm -hmm. well, I talk a lot about love. that. Yeah. Stealing the love that you, you didn't get legitimately. Yeah, but and then I played a lot of sports. So like, you know, I like sports, sports, sports. And I mean, like when I was kicking that soccer ball, it was my mother's head. Good. So, so I could like release emotions that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it seemed like your paranoia was coming from hypervigilance. Yeah, I was on hyper, hyper alert. Um, like I was I was just consumed uh into that world i call it an alt alternative world um you uh like an adaption like a denial of, of the trauma because i had no recall but mm -hmm. i mean like it was showing itself everywhere so um i i don't know if you guys read about this part but i talk about um when there was somebody ringing the at the door knocking and uh i looked out and it was an old woman dressed in black and she had like a really long knife and she was banging off the mailbox. And uh, there were that was a hallucination and there was nobody there. But I mean, that hallucination transferred into um, my mother had threatened my life. And because I couldn't like comprehend those things, uh, it would present itself in all the symptoms. It was really bizarre. Yeah, but it's also one of those things of why, again, from with someone who has no sort of professional experience in this field, it's why I find those sort of labels so unfair <laughs> because they don't, you know, just calling someone paranoid sounds flippant. Like everything that mm. you went through, I was oh, like, yeah. yeah, I'd be paranoid. You know, it's terrifying, some of that stuff. Well, I don't like the words crazy or like the only reason I use the word schizophrenia because I want to – so people understand what I'm writing about and then I can tie it into the trauma because if I was just to say, oh, I was so traumatized as a kid. It wouldn't have the power. I had that diagnosis. Mm. I agree. So that's right. why I use it and it's important for me to use it. And I do get a lot of heck for using it, but I'm keeping it. I think you should because I think you're saying this is what they diagnose as schizophrenia. Trauma. Exactly. 
And like 90% of the cases is all trauma related. Like there is some cases where there's a underlying medical condition that's causing hallucinations. But mm-hmm. I mean, for the most part, I'm pretty sure it's all trauma. Mm-hmm. Right. That because I talk too. to people with schizophrenia all the time. And I know the language. Like, I mean, like I can spend like 20 minutes with somebody and just listen to their language because it's, you know, it's a lot of metaphors. And I can usually pinpoint what happened to them because they're always trying to tell you. And then the therapist isn't listening or the psychiatrist. Well, psychiatrists have 15 minutes now. (laughs) Really? Oh, yeah. It's horrible. Look, they used to charge. $300 Three hundred dollars and four hundred and up an hour, but the insurance companies said they wouldn't do that. So they see people for a, for fifteen minutes for one hundred and fifty dollars, and they make their money. And exactly. So, and all they do is prescribe and ask a few questions, and that's it. So they yeah, make they all their money. Do, they usually ask, done. "How's your minutes doing?" Blah blah blah, and then like. Yes. Depending on your answer they'll be like okay well we'll put you on this one well maybe lower dose on this one it's just the management of the medication that's all they're doing yeah they're psychopharmacologists and they're paid very well and mind you they're dovetail into the insurance industry and the psychopharmaceutical industry yeah that really that really pisses me off because i know like the suffering like for psychosis how Oh my God, it's so horrible. Like not being out of touch with reality. I mean, like it's a terrifying experience and all you want to do is offer them a pill. Yeah. Well, and make money. All you want to do is make money. money. So you do what you can to make more money. You know, and every time I bring that up, like I'm like, well, let's talk about the money angle, like the money they're getting. And, you know, a lot of them are in it for the money, you know, and, you know, people argue with me about that all the time. How can you say that? There are good psychiatrists out there. And I'm like, yeah, well, maybe there is a few. But I mean, like, they're not bio psychiatrists. They're more trauma informed. And, but I mean, like, I get people give me shit for that all the time. And they're a miserable lot. You know, the pe- the physicians who are most likely to kill themselves are dentists. And right after that come psychiatrists. Whoa, oh. didn't know that. And no, veterinarians, I'm... but that's a, another issue. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But well, no, I... I mean, the medical, you know, industry, I think is, I think the caretaking industry in general is a difficult industry to be in if you actually want to yeah. care. Yeah, about yeah. care for your, your, whether it's your clients or your patients. Because I will say, like, I have friends that are psychiatrists that are trying to help people in the context that they can, but the context being so extraordinarily limited. Yeah. 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 Yes. That it's. I mean, you know, I can't necessarily blame them for being like, hey, I'm just I'm trying to do the best that I can in this horrible system that we have. Right. Well, I mean, like with schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar or whatever, that's not like, you know, you need intense therapy. It's got to go on for like a couple of years and nobody's willing to pay for that. And then you have the sufferer's defense mechanisms that you have to break through to. And a a lot of people don't know how to do that. So, I mean, like they more or less just give up and just blame the patient and, and, and move on. But I mean, we need more funding, like healing homes and, you know, or somebody write a book, like how to recover and, you know, and then families can work with it. I don't know. Maybe, but I think what they're told to do is to go and go to some psychiatrist and they believe the authorities. And so you'd have to have a countervailing authority. Someone like R.D. Lang in Tavistock, let people progress and grow themselves up again. But that took time. They all got cured. They all got healed. But it took time and money. Well, um, years ago, like I talk about in my book about Jack Rosberg. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I absolutely adored him. He was like the best psychologist ever. Like he would go in and work with it. Um, I mean, if somebody called him from a different country, he'd jump on a plane and he'd go. And he had this direct confront therapy I believe it was called and he was actually helping people heal 
So anyways, we had a friendship for like eight years and, um, and he was studying my case. Um, he asked me if I could go to the university and see if we could set up uh, like a talk like from him and I. And so I went to go for a meeting and, uh, you know, I like I have all the documents of, that I was schizophrenic and, you know, my recovery and all that and my record, whatever. And I presented all that. And they said, well, congratulations on your recovery. It was your time, but not others. What? That was the answer. What did they mean even? I don't even that, understand that, that, what it yeah, means. That, that, like, I mean, like, you know, you recovered. That's great. But it was your time, not others. We just leave things alone. Wow. And then another psychiatrist had said to me, um, cause he was actually listening to me or whatever. And then his last statement was, uh, there'll be mass lawsuits. We can't go blaming parents or doing that. We're going to get wow. sued. So those are some of the, so the, the answers that I got when I was trying to like approach people, uh, with Jack's work and my work. This is one of the interesting things because, uh, previous conversations on this podcast have been about the demands of uh the societies we all sort of collectively live in and neoliberalism essentially pushes you to be the best version of you right like there's no let up everything yes. is on your shoulders and the sort of interesting i guess tension is that actually your story is exactly that like granted you're not trying to be elon musk you're not exploiting a whole bunch of workers you're not trying to earn millions and squillions of dollars you're just trying to survive right but you mm. you you are actually sort of part of that self-determinating thing that is held up as, you know, that's the, the perfect way to be. And mm -hmm. it's interesting, exactly in the thing that you just said, that the context is that that's how they treated you. Like, oh, you're just the sort of lucky individual who got through it. And, we, exactly. we, and that's how we're just going to frame it. Um, and that's how they do frame it. Or another thing they'll do, like I was like telling a psychiatrist the other day, like he had read a, he had written a study and he used uh, John Nash as the example of full recovery. And I'm like, why are you using a scholar? Um, people are going to read it and say, oh, I can't recover it. I'm not a scholar. I go, why don't you just use stories like mine? Like just, you know, ordinary, like, you know, I've gone to college, but I'm not a scholar. Um, and then the sufferer will read that and say, hey, well, maybe I can do it too. Mm. But they're using scholars as examples, which I believe is all wrong. Like, I mean, you have to have this like IQ of like 190 or 200 to like beat schizophrenia. There, I think part of that too is also this tendency towards, I mean, there, as I mentioned, there's the credentialist aspect. You know, and and to a degree, this is a society that you, what is what is credentialism to a certain degree is linked with meritocracy, right? Yes, and meritocracy and education are very closely linked. So, in order to for somebody to be exemplary and be a authority figure, because to a degree, a, you know, ex, a case example is. An, a form of like an authority, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have that, you know, if you're not meritocratic enough, you won't be a good example. That's kind of the top down mentality of if we're going to set up an example, we want an exemplary example, not a realistic one, right. not a complicated one but an exemplary one. And you see that with any kind of, you know, men, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health, because for example, if you have a complex medical diagnosis and, you know, you manage to improve your health, a lot of times you get very similar responses from doctors, which is, well, I guess you're lucky or something worked for you. But, yeah. you know, many times they're not curious as to what worked for you. Mm -hmm. Right. If they're it's like, not a medical saleable cure. Right. Well, I mean, like when I'm on Twitter, I get blocked a lot from uh, biopsychiatrists all the time. 
Mm-hmm. Like first they're interested and then they're like, oh my God, she didn't use medication block. Yeah, it's threatening. Yeah. Well, because it's also, it's become like legally threatening, right? That's what I think too, lawsuits. Well, it's it's not, it's also just, you know, because a lot of times if you don't offer medication, you're setting yourself up for potential lawsuit as much as if you do. I mean, if you do, you're you're setting yourself up for less. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you do have to justify that if you have insurance clients, you have to justify why you aren't using medication. But right. in hypnosis, if somebody is finding, is exploring and will find out that their parents were incest abusers, often a therapist will get them to sign that they will not be involved in a lawsuit so that you can then get out of it that way, but allow people to remember what they need to. One psychiatrist was telling me that like, you know, uh, with his patients or whatever, when incest or uh, stuff like that come up, that um, he's petrified of the families because then, you know, the sufferer gets better or whatever. Like, I mean, like just somebody traumatized by it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they confront, they go in to confront the parents or whatever you did this. Well, the psychiatrist is like very uneasy thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to be involved with this. I could get sued, you know, because I'm like condoning it. So I think they have that fear, too, because a lot. Remember that years ago they had that false uh the memory false memory thing. foundation. Remember that? Yeah. And then people were coming out and said, Dad, you did this, 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 and that. And then it just got all covered up with that, you know, false memory syndrome thing. Yes, I remember that because the Freyd family, F-R-E-Y-D, I'm really. Yeah, I was like know, excited about they that. They are very, very rich incest abusers. And they got other very wealthy incest abusers to give them money. And then they got a psychologist who would agree with them to and mm-hmm. sue people whose children were suing them for incest abuse. So that, you know, where you can get money given and suits involved, you go into, gen, you know, very dangerous territory, which is why Many hypnotherapists were advised to have somebody sign a document before that they wouldn't be part of a lawsuit, no matter what was found. Yeah. Right. Well, Well, um, I know I know when I like went through my recovery or whatever, my baby sister, I've always like, I don't know, we're just we're just bonded. But I mean, like there's times where I've been away from her for like a few years at at a time because we used to trigger each other off. but I mean, I had to leave my entire family to do this. I bet. And they were angry with me. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, you let you exposed them. Yeah, they were angry. Like, I mean, I couldn't go back. No. They didn't want me well. They also didn't want their secret of abuse out. Exactly. Because part of these family practices count on secrecy. And if you stop keeping the secret, you're out of the group. Mm -hmm. Don't tell is a very big part of it. In the right wing in the United States, focus on family and other religious organizations push the family, the nuclear family, even as it falls apart. Many episodes ago, we had uh, Ian Parker, who is the co-author of Psychoanalysis and Revolution, and his um, sort of idea, I guess, what was new to me was this idea that the unconscious isn't some sort of mystical realm inside our heads, but it's the things that are not said in Mm. a sort of social context, that the unconscious is inherently a social thing. Um, Mm. It's sort of between us. It's sort of a network and uh yeah more and more i think there's some real truth to that and this idea of the group or the family keeping their secrets the things that are not mm. said those are exactly the things that haunt people's minds and and those are also just group dynamics in general 
doesn't just apply to the family. It, it applies to a lot of group settings. Just look what they did to gay people when mm. they labeled them diseased. Right. Like, that I used mean, to be in the diagnostic that? statistical manual. Yes. Homosexuality used to be a diagnosis of perversion. I know. Do you guys think that there's hope for the future? Just sort of returning to the thing in your book, it's like you had this spirit of, I'm going to survive. I'm not just going to mm. survive, I'm going to get better. Like it, And I feel like that is probably a key reason why any of us are here, is that in our distant past, our ancestors probably went through all kinds of horrible stuff. But yeah. they found a way to survive and they found a way to um, have people that they cared about and that cared about them. And so I think uh, as long as that sort of drive exists, uh, it's not always going to be 100% positive, but it's it's possible to uh, for things to be better always. Yeah, I think so too, because I don't, well, it's, it's documented that the human race would never have survived if people were just individuals. You know, it, it took a whole band to, to drive a big animal into the hole and dig the hole for the animal. And then they shared primitive communism and sharing what they had was necessary when they didn't have much. And that's how the human race started. And I do think cooperation and consideration, whether it's economic cooperatives being the basis of your economic system and accountability and power sharing and economic sharing are the key to the future of the human race. I don't know whether we'll survive because of climate change, but I think that as long as we're here, we have to work for those things. Yeah, it's it seems like, uh, you know, like with uh, the new technology that's been around for a while now that we can be more open and we can talk about all these things. And and I would just like that schizophrenia and psychosis is is understood and talked more about and that we can, you know, paint a different picture that these people aren't like crazed killers running around. No. Um, right. The stereotype around. Yeah, like I just want that variant. to go away. And I think one of the, I guess, kind of dovetailing into whether things will get better or not, I don't really have, you know, I, I tend to be, a, I, I'm a pessimist by nature, so I, I can't necessarily comment on that by my personality. But the one important thing is always really, I at the end of the day, Really good engagement, honest engagement, yes. kind engagement is what brings more understanding mm -hmm. and more cooperation, you know. Yes, it to, does. To now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave. I didn't realize it's this late. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's a wonderful conversation. And Tracy, I'm really grateful to you for your book. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Oh, I just wanted to finish. Yeah. Um, and one of the major importance of these, you know, individual accountings, like Tracy, of their process, is shows the diversity of backgrounds of any given condition. Because one of the things about uh, any diagnosis is is this severe limitation that comes with it. Assumptions about your past, assumptions about your present, assumptions about your ability, assumptions about, you know, what's the best path forward, rather than really working with people individually to assess what is really happening with this person. Mm -hmm. You know, because so much about a lot of working in substance, you know, um, use disorder. There's so much fixation on a top-down outcome that is forced on two people. 
and the mm-hmm. harms that can come from that. And I also see a lot of that in mental health with mental health. It's like, oh, we want you to get you well enough to be able to work. Right. So and rather than like we want you to get better. We want you to feel better. We want you to feel like a human being again. We want you to be able to feel again. Like those are really not things that are part of the importance in the treatment environment a lot of times. You know, the treatment environment is limited often too. We just want you to be well enough to be out of our hair. Yeah, like, I mean, like, they just bypass the whole healing process. You know, we're not focused on that. We're just going to get you medicated and, you know, send you on your way. Because one of the major issues that I often talk about that's missing in, especially in mental health conditions, is you should have few years off. Like you should be able to take time off away from stress, away from being able to survive and make a living, pay the rent. I think so too. Like a, uh, what do you call that? Like a disability payment. Absolutely. And that's one of the hardest things to come by, at least, you know, in the United States is this I mean, disability in the United States is basically enforced poverty. Oh, my God. The payout is so low, right? You're not allowed to make, if you make above a certain income, you get kicked off of all these benefits. If you get married, oftentimes you are kicked off of a lot of benefits. There are major limitations in disability and people who need time off to work on their mental health, especially for, you know, long-term homeless who have been on the streets for a very long time. You can't expect people to be able to end up a fully functioning person without giving them the the time and energy and ability. Yeah, I think that would probably take a, maybe a three to five year like plan to really come off the streets and get it all together. I just think that it's a little different in Canada. We do have like, we have universal insurance and, uh, you know, extended healthcare where, you know, people, if they need to take time, especially like I worked in government, if you need to like have a few months off, you can go and do that. And that's really, we have those resources here. Like, I mean, like on the Island, like, we have a lot of resources and a lot of group therapy, a lot of therapy. We have a lot of shelters. We have secondhand housing. Like we have a lot of resources here. It's good. Which is good. Which is. I don't I, know about the rest of Canada, but I know what goes on in my community. And that that is one aspect that I think often really doesn't get mentioned is whether physical illness, you know, one of, I often say that the opioid crisis is often a working conditions crisis, especially when it comes to like prescription opioids. So many people in the United States do not get time off work to heal from injuries. So temporary injuries become permanent injuries, which become chronic pain which necessitate the use of painkillers. And that we have these draconian prescription laws that prevent pain patients fundamentally from assessing medication that allows them to continue working or become homeless. And it's this horrible cycle. And to a certain degree, it's also true with mental health in that people aren't given time and ability to really heal. And as a result, they end up needing and dependent on medication in order to function. I remember I was talking to one young man. He didn't have schizophrenia. He was just like down and out and homeless. And uh, he had nowhere to go. And I said, well, why don't you just go to the welfare, like your government? And, you know, maybe they'll help you get a place and everything. So he tried it. And the front desk person that interviewed him said, well, you have two arms and two legs. You can work. Goodbye. Wow. Yeah. See, this is one of the things like, ideologically, I don't think we can be making decisions about 
what is the right way to be in the world unless there's a, just a general background of support, you know, that you cannot possibly fall through. You know, this idea of being, you know, this the self, uh, not self-aggrandizing, but the, you know, the ultimate uh, rugged individual. Like, if you really wanted to... I don't know, believe that and really test it. I think you have to test it with everyone sort of starting from the same place. Like that's the myth of it, right? Is that mm. like, we're, again, the meritocratic thing. So we all start at the same place. We've all got 24 hours in a day, you know, go make make yourself uh, however you want. But it's it's not the truth. And it's like until, until everyone has uh, health care, somewhere to live, some food, and they're not sort of terrified <laughs> for their for their life like we can't be making decisions about you know how humans are mm -hmm. um there needs to be and yeah yeah i guess i'm just going on a sort of down a rabbit hole i think it's, you're from the uk right yeah 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 so you i think you have the same healthcare system as us that's right yeah the nhs is, yeah uh, so i mean like are they uh like in your in the uk or do they like turn people away and make them homeless? Uh, I mean, the homelessness thing has, over the past uh, 10 or so years, basically ever since the sort of coalition government got in, you basically had a huge rise in homelessness ever since because they have, you know, sort of austerity, essentially. It's the sort of privatisation of everything. It's yeah. sort of not taking responsibility for... Yeah, you know the job which is to sort of look after your citizens to some degree so there is a a, a rising homelessness problem um and things have certainly got worse over the last um 10 or so years however the nhs does exist and it is amazing in that respect obviously the problem being that covid happens and you've got uh 10 years of underfunding well more than that probably and then covid hits and so it's it's been really tough um and but but there certainly are it's not as brutal as the american system but again you know really i'm just here as a <laughs> sort of editor producer and uh, sort of just to listen and ask questions so i don't i don't really have enough experience but certainly from the guests that we've spoken to in the past um lucy johnston being a sort of key one she was one of the lead authors of the power threat meaning framework which is really quite a sort of progressive uh way of looking at mental health stuff along the lines of everything we've been talking about really um uh you know she certainly sees the the madness in the system um and that the the danger is for the uk that it goes in the same direction as the states that that money and the pursuit of profit takes over. I, I think it might be going that way because my husband, he's a com commodity investor. So he's always like watching the stock market. Yep. And he said, and I asked him to have a look and see like where the, where the, what they're investing in, like to do with mental health. And uh, there's like millions and billions of dollars going into these new apps, mental health apps. Yep. And he said, there's more investors now than ever that are jumping on the mental health bandwagon so yeah. he was telling me that it's going to go to all apps and like zoom meetings for appointments and that's where they're headed right yeah right yeah I have. and then that makes me think like is there going to be a lot of layoffs like what's going to go on there well some of the apps i think is also like covid influenced because oh no these these i I answered that question because I told him to like check it on a chart. Mm. And these apps have been around since 2015. They're just oh, no, they, they have been. They have been. I think COVID yeah. really ramped up the use of apps. Exactly. You know, and also. To a certain degree, I don't necessarily dislike the ac Internet access to mental health only in the sense that a lot of people you know, have to, when you take in like driving time or transportation time, especially yeah. in the United States, you aren't often given the time off of work to go attend to your mental health. 
So app access makes that a lot more accessible to people in that they don't have to factor in transportation time and whatnot to access mental health. On the other just, hand, on the other I, hand, there are severe downsides to a disjointed in personal format. I think what I'm referencing is like people with psychosis. Mm. Right. Like, I mean, like, like I totally believe that like if you have like full-blown psychosis that you should be like in a hospital setting mm. um and get more help but then you know you go to the hospital and that's not a good move too so i mean like they're basically on their own yeah yeah so i mean i'm just like i don't like i because of COVID, I have to talk to my doctor in a Zoom meeting. I don't mind that at all. It's actually convenient. Right. Just for like all the people that like, you know, are on the streets or, you know, paranoid schizophrenia. Like, how's that going to work for them? They don't even like electronics, most of them. Right. Mm -hmm. They think point. it's bugged. They think it's right. bugged. Well, one one aspect of mental health is generally that they tend to ignore severe diagnosis of any given condition. What do you mean by ignore? Ignore in terms of there's very little care if you oh. have severe mental health. Right. So that, you're basically just on your own, like on the streets. I with yeah. I mean you one aspect of at least therapy in the United States is that because it's mostly private practice, a lot of therapists do not train for severe conditions. They mainly train for mild to moderate depression and anxiety. Oh, okay. And anything outside of that is often above their pay grade. They're not really trained for it. Um, so and if you limit care to just psychologists with PhDs that, you know, narrows, extremely narrows down access to providers. So it's a, it's a big issue of, of why mental, mental health, like talk therapy that's necessary in severe cases, at least stateside can be extremely limited in access. Yeah, and I don't really think it exists uh, too much. I think it's just like, you know, medication and that's it. But I mean, like, I must say that like on the island here, whatever we have, like uh, halfway homes, and we also have like a lot of subsidized uh, housing where we're building, like we just finished one where we build like studio apartments and everything, and then take the people off the street with severe mental illness and then the, the churches pick up a lot of the slack too with meals mm. and shelter there's a really good uh um story in one of is it Red, uh Retka brugman's books well i can't can't remember his name but uh, i think it was a uh, utopia for realists and, and i th i think it's in that book where he talks about a bunch of homeless people were just given uh, i think it was five thousand dollars might have been ten thousand uh, rather than it go to charity or, you know, the charities that look after them, they just gave it to them directly and 70% of them just sorted their life out. Right. Um, oh, yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, and it's just, again, it's the sort of trusting in people, <laughs> you know. Um, obviously, there's 30% who it didn't work out, so you still have to sort of help them out. But, you know, this is one of sort of David Graeber, the sort of famous... Um, you know, anarchist, anthropology. anthropologist and anarchist uh, academic, he was, his whole thing is that, you know, the future of our economies should be based around care. Um, and I agree. I mean, that, that is the whole, I think, one thing about hyper-individualism that really forgets about our very base nature is that we are a social species and we are a social species because we require care. It's not an option. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. On the, on that note, I think that I'm going to. Yeah, it's been uh, very long. <laughs> pull out of the, the meeting. Yeah. 
Um, well, thank you, thank you very much, Tracy. Like, uh, I, I really you. your, your book was amazing, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes, and I'll put a link to your website as well. Okay, um, awesome. And, thank you very much, yeah. and uh, nice meeting both of you. Yeah, you too. Uh, thank you very much. It was Take. also a pleasure talking. Thank you. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye. 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 By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. Capitalism Hits Home is a sort of broader over overhead view. It explores the way that capitalism shapes our personal lives, our psyches, our relationships, our families, and it looks particularly at the sea change in American personal life as all Americans, but the top 10 or 20 percent of Americans, have our security and our chance for a future become as precarious as it always was for minorities and families headed by women. It's not just in your head and capitalism hits home are definitely complimentary. And if listeners would like to check out Capitalism Hits Home, Harriet, where should they go to find it? Either on YouTube or Democracy at Work or on my own website, harrietfraud.com.